I don't really understand how anybody who just sort of takes a, a cursory look at democratic policymaking over the last several decades. I, I, I don't understand how anybody could reasonably conclude, even now at this point where we've seen movement left, that it's liberals and progressives who are in the driver's seat of the party. There isn't the same relationship between left politicians and us. They don't really seem to have much of an appetite to come on these shows. There are tougher questions that are asked in these shows, and there's tough questions that they get on the, on the mainstream media, but it seems like they have more of an appetite to you know, be asked, you know, how much does this cost by Brianna Keeler? You know, how are yeah. you gonna pay for it? Then they do yeah. being asked, okay, why won't you force a vote by Brianna Gray? I go to my uh, attitude towards the whole thing, which is just to kind of shrug and say, well, you just roll the dice and maybe you win an election. Um, just do, I, do the right thing. <laughs> yeah, because it's just yeah. so, so difficult. I am thrilled to be joined today by three of the biggest names in left policy thinking, journalism, reporting, um, and to tackle one of the thorniest kind of policy and messaging issues that has been captivating the left for the last few months to a year, shall we say. Um, first up, we have Osita Nuevu, contributing editor to The New Republic. Welcome, Osita. Hi. Uh, we have Eric Levitt of New York Magazine. Welcome, Eric. Hey. And Matt Brunig of the People's Policy Project. Welcome back, Matt. Hello. Okay, so the topic du jour is David Shore. Shoreism, uh, for the uninitiated, who wants to take a crack at explaining what exactly it is and why it's so controversial? At least the first half of that. Yeah, uh, so David Shore is a data scientist with the Democratic Party. He was um, kind of a whiz kid on the Obama 2012 campaign. Uh, where he built kind of their in-house Nate Silver forecasting sort of machine. And um, he has kind of a, uh, in some ways it's a very conventional analysis, but it's kind of uh, informed by sort of the same sort of ethos as effective altruism, I guess. Uh, it's a utilitarian sort of worldview uh, that is very, approaches politics from a very sort of uh, data um heavy uh, analysis where you're basically trying to solve this optimization problem of you want to maximize the amount of substantive good that you're going to do at the lowest political cost because uh, sort of a cornerstone of the worldview is that it's extremely important to keep Republicans out of power because they are, um, you know, if not fascist, then authoritarian. And so from that, uh, the basic sort of, corner of cornerstone of his analysis is that Democrats uh, really need to increase their support among working class voters, especially white working class voters, uh, both because 72% or so of the electorate is white um, and most white voters are non-college educated, and because our electoral institutions heavily overrepresent represent um, non-college educated white voters. So, um, yeah. So, so what Schur has observed, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there has been a swing where the Democratic Party is increasingly reliant on college-educated white voters, and that non-college-educated voters, both white and, frankly, Black and Latino alike, are shifting toward the Republican Party. And that one cause of that, arguably, is that on a messaging basis, the Democratic Party is increasingly represented by younger, more uh, college-educated people who, from a messaging perspective, aren't attracting a demographically different base that once was very much wedded and found a safe a safe place, as it were, within the Democratic Party. That's a much more eloquent way of uh, putting it, I would say. Yeah, I think that that's, that's basically the view is that you used to have a sort of a Democratic Party apparatus that was, you know, a bit more informed uh, by labor unions than by sort of the progressive nonprofits. Um, you had a bit more uh, of these institutions that were really accountable to a mass sort of working class base, had a more transactional sort of approach to politics. Now you have these advocacy groups that are largely untethered from the constituencies that they claim to represent and are populated by um, progressive sort of 
ideologues, um, and that, uh, you know, this kind of informs the messaging choices of the party, and that, you know, specifically between 2012 and 2016, there was this transition in messaging away from emphasis on um, class and redistribution, sort of just in terms of rhetoric, uh, to a rhetoric that more emphasized, um, you know, who we are as a nation and, and the values um, that Donald Trump represents and rejecting them, and that uh, in Shore's analysis, this was really pivotal uh, and determinative uh, of Trump's election. So, Sita, in many ways, this sounds like a tale as old as time and a bell that progressives have been ringing forever. The progressives, um, you know, in the wake of 2017 or 2016, rather, after Donald Trump won, there was this class race discussion that in some ways has never ended, um, where progressives, the left, the Bernie left, was pointing out that Donald Trump had run on a lot of these kind of traditional democratic issues. He was talking about trade and Midwestern jobs being sent overseas and, you know, obviously had a kind of a protectionist America first stance or or kind of like veneer to all of that. But the basic idea that he was standing up for the working person was what left the left was saying was what got him to win, even if he was misrepresenting, you know, what he was going to do for that community, that he was speaking in language that was resonating with a class group that both corporate parties had largely ignored in more recent history. So if this is not so attenuated in some respects from the traditional left argument, as opposed to the liberal argument, which was basically Donald Trump pandered to racist and won purely through kind of that kind of uh, dog whistling and uh, racist leveraging, why are so many people on the left so frustrated with Shore's analysis? Because Shore's analysis isn't a defense of leftism per se. I mean, there are left policies he thinks that are worth pursuing and left policies he thinks aren't worth pursuing. Mm. He would say that Medicare for all doesn't poll as well as a more moderate kind of health care reform or raising or lowering the price of prescription drugs. So the party shouldn't focus on, progressive actors shouldn't focus on Medicare for all. They should focus on more modest policies. Right now, in this reconciliation debate we're having, he's made the argument that universal policies aren't going to be as popular as means testing, this or that. That's part of the reconciliation package. So Democrats should go for means testing instead of uh, trying to make, you know, free community college um, a universal thing, you know. So that's, that, that's I think, the, the first immediate kind of tension there. Um, and, you know, there are other policies that, that, that Shore thinks um, Democrats should talk more about that are in keeping with left principles. So one of the things that he and I are in real alignment about is the fact that if you ask, uh, you know, working people in polls, should workers have more rights at work? Should workers be given ownership shares in the companies that they work for? Democratic rights. That polls extremely well. Mm-hmm. Um, the Democracy Collaborative did a poll, I think, a couple of years ago on this question. It's not something that gets polled often, but... When it does get pulled, the things that we sort of consider the roots of socialism actually pull surprisingly well. Things like the job guarantee pull well. So, you know, it's, it's, Shoreism or popularism, as some people call it, isn't just, you know, this idea that left policies just sort of universally pull well and that's what we should do to win back the working class. I think Shore looks at the polling and says, well, this left policy might not work uh, so well with voters. This more right wing policy might be more popular. So we'll do that. It's, it's, it's not an, ideological approach in keeping with uh, what Sanders tried to do in 2016 Mm. and in 2020. Well, what's interesting is that, you know, saying that, say, Medicare for all isn't as popular as some other more moderate health care reform is a line that we heard a lot from pretty much every body in the 2020 primary race, except for Bernie Sanders and maybe Elizabeth Warren. And what's was always curious to me about that argument is that it seems to me that there's a natural middle ground between a pure poll driven politics and an understanding that you need to have some ethics. You can't just win based on the, the the thing that people like the most. If Medicare for all is in fact popular, overwhelmingly popular, even if it's not the not not the most popular version of events, and you think it's also the most moral and the policy that has the most long-term legs on it and ability to have the longest and more, most permanent benefit, then the point is that you need a, pop, a policy to be popular, not that it needs to be the most popular. And it's confusing to me why that isn't obvious. So, like, <laughs> I mean, I think we're going to get into, like, more specific issues with what Shore said, I think, over the course of the discussion. But, like, as you've alluded to, I think there's just, like, a very basic conceptual problem or set of problems with this approach to politics. I mean, the prescription that they offer 
is, is often in, in sort of pat way delivered as do and say popular things, right? Look at what the polls say. Look at what has a broad base of support in, amongst the American public and do those things because those things are going to be less alienating to the electorate. But then you sort of prod somebody like Shore. And Shore, you know, I think is like a generous, serious interlocutor. You know, participant in discussion certainly more generous and serious than some of the people who've taken his side. So when you, you, you prod poor, uh, Shore on this, he'll, you know, and ask him, you know, if, if the American public tomorrow, for whatever reason, came out and supported another war in the Middle East, or they supported putting Muslims in camps, and that was like a popular policy, should we do that? And he's like, no, obviously we shouldn't do that. David Shore supports statehood for the District of Columbia. You know, that's a policy that is less popular than some of the other democracy reform proposals that are being offered in things like the For the People Act. But he thinks it's worth doing because he'll say, well, you know, there are going to be unpopular things that are still, you know, on, on some level worth doing either strategically or on a substantive policy basis. Okay. What about policies that are unpopular now that might become more popular later on? So one of the examples people have offered in the last week or so is the auto bailout. Hmm. Um, initially, the auto bailout was not very popular, even in the Midwest, even in places like Michigan amongst voters. Uh, within a couple of years, it became this thing that became a major feature of the 2012 presidential campaign, something that people thought was a really good thing. If you just looked at the polls at the outset, somebody like David Shore might have said, well, don't do that. That's going to be something that kills you with voters. Hmm. I think that somebody like Shore would recognize, okay, that's another caveat. You know, what about popular things that become unpopular? Uh, so, you know, looking again at the reconciliation stuff that's happening right now, um, one of the concerns people have had is that, you know, Shaw and others will say that some of the provisions are now being seen by voters as overly generous. There, there is a contingency of, of the electorate now that might want to see people or Congress start dialing back on things like the, the CTC and uh, other benefits, even though they might have been popular at the outset. That's another thing that can happen with policy. And then on top of this, you know, back a couple of months ago, when the Sunrise Movement was going after the Biden administration on climate, and they were saying, look, why doesn't Biden come out and, and talk about the Green New Deal or more aggressive climate policy? Um, mm -hmm. Why doesn't he do more from the White House? The response from people like Iglesias and Shore was like, well, you know, even if policy is popular, having the president or candidate come out and talk about it is something that actually polarizes the issue further. So you don't actually want people to talk about, uh, you know, high intensity issues in many cases, because that'll actually make policies more popular. Okay. So like, what, what are we actually left with once you like incorporate all of these different caveats? You end up saying something like, well, you should do and say popular things that are good and not popular things that are bad. And also some unpopular things that can be worth doing. Th this is just politics that you're describing. Right. Like you're, you're, you're just describing democracy, right? So this idea that Shorism is a novel kind of holistic perspective on how Democrats should go about politics doesn't really seem right to me. I mean, I don't think it really says very much of anything once you incorporate all the different caveats and provisos. And, you know, it, it doesn't offer very much of a perspective on what the party should do now beyond saying what I, David Shore, think is a policy priority or what I, Matt Iglesias, think is a policy priority is the thing to do here. Because we're going to disagree about what policies are worth taking political risk. We're going to disagree yeah. about what policies are good or not. The, the, the idea of just sort of looking at the polls and seeing what they say doesn't really resolve the fundamental questions that we engage in politics to answer. Yeah, well, my observation has been that Shoreism, popularism has been exploited, not necessarily by any fault of Shore, by people who want to make arguments against specific policies that they attribute to being part of kind of the woke left, right? So it's a justification for saying I, we shouldn't talk about defund the police or we shouldn't talk about immigration, which may or may not be ideologically driven by some actors, right? But there is obviously a certain degree of backlash, at least in the kind of journalism literati sphere from taking those positions, some of those positions because of the racial valences of them. So if you can say these just pull well, and ultimately, if you want to protect the rights of immigrants and black people and what have you, you got to win. And therefore, I can justify being anti-defund the police without having to get into the merits of the conversation on the basis of the polling. Does that is that an uncharitable reading? You think? I I, I think if I understand you correctly, I, I do think it is the case that the the real world impact of, of Shore's analysis has been you know there's been the people with the power to sort of uh, turn Shore into um, a real 
guru within the the sort of uh, media sphere and Democratic Party uh, are more interested in the part of his analysis that is critical of left wing activists than the part that uh, tacitly anyway indicts centrist Democrats who are opposing DC statehood, um, statehood for Puerto Rico and for uh, the Virgin Islands. These other structural reforms that address what I think is the most important part of Shore's analysis, which is the the descriptive core, not the prescriptive um, part, but the, the uh, way that he, through sort of analyzing the trends in election results, um, paints this really grim picture of where the Democrats are headed if they are not able to increase, you know, expand their coalition more in white rural America. Um, and, you know, there's a bunch of things Democrats could do with the, the grip on power that they have right now to um, address that problem directly, uh, and they're, they're not doing it. Um, and similarly, they're also potentially not going to do some of the most popular reforms that uh, are available to them, such as the prescription drug um, drug pricing uh, controls, basically. Um, so, so I think that that aspect is 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 correct. I want to come back to this um, this point because I think that core to what's going on here is the fact that persuasion as an idea seems completely divorced from the way we talk about politics. And what ends up happening is we talk about some of these policies. That okay, you can talk about them, they become po- polarized, and they become more negatively negatively perceived. The only direction persuasion seems to go when we're having these discussions is negative. There's never any kind of receptivity to the idea that by talking about a policy, by reframing a policy, by educating people on a policy like let's say defund the police, that it could ever conceivably move in the other direction. And I think that's because of a certain kind of understanding of how the racial politics of the country work and perhaps a little bit of Afro pessimism. But before we get into that, because I think that could be a lengthy conversation, I want to ask you, Matt, um, about these popular policies that we're talking about in the context of the reconciliation bill one of the most heralded being the child tax credit, which we all heard many praises sung earlier this year. We're having child poverty. We're having a new FDR moment. It's the new New Deal. And now we're seeing that these policies are being, they're on the chopping block, much like all of the other good things that were promised in these reconciliation bills. You've been engaged in some really interesting conversations about that intersect with the limits of shorism insofar as Shore had a prescription on how to improve the CTC that you think is wrong, in part because it's an over-reliance on polls without a sufficient understanding on uh, of the policy. Can you unpack that a little for us? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. He, he doesn't usually make a whole lot of hard proclamations, I would say. I think there's a lot of kind of general framework building about, you know, doing popular things, not doing unpopular things, using popular slogans, hiding less, you know, like there's a lot of kind of general stuff. And then you get into particulars and it gets a little bit more hairy and a little bit more uncertain. But he did jump in and wrote a piece at Slow Boring, which is Matt Iglesias's newsletter, in which he said, you know what, the Democrats should, they should further means test the child tax credit. Right now, if you, the benefit starts phasing out if you have income over $150,000, if you're a married couple. And he was saying, maybe bring that down to $50,000. Mansion actually a couple of days ago said maybe $60,000. So maybe he's reading uh, Shor's uh, newsletter uh, mm-hmm. writings. So I don't know. Um, you're like, okay, well, all right, why? Why do that? Um, you know, what's the point? And he's like, well, it's popular. Actually, the more means, the more you means test a program, the more popular it is. And, you know, I had actually two, two main problems with it. The one that I wrote about at People's Policy Project was that, you know, the reasoning he used to conclude this was he was saying, look, means testing is bad. Of course, I know. I understand all the problems with means testing, uh, especially as it relates to access to the poor. Even if they're included, if you include an income test, they now have to prove their income if they work in informal sectors or they can't fill out paperwork very well or whatever. You lose a lot of people through that process. I get all that. But guess what? We already have that because you have to be below 150 bringing 150 down to 50 or 60, that that makes no difference. So the problems with mean testing are already there. And if we bring it down, we can bring the cost down and then we can make it more permanent and making it permanent is good and on and on goes the reasoning. Hmm. And the policy problem with this was the assumption that means testing's only problem is that it creates paperwork hassles. There is another problem when it comes to the child tax credit which is that because the payment is based on how much money you made last year, 
but your eligibility is actually based on the income you made this year. There are many people who maybe had low enough incomes to be qualified last year, but whose income goes up, they get over the threshold, and now they don't, they're not as eligible as they once were. Maybe they're eligible for none of it, maybe they're only eligible for some of it. And what happens when you wind up in that situation is you get an overpayment and then you have to pay it back at tax time. And right now, okay, if it's if it starts phasing out at 150, you know, that's a pretty good amount of income. Maybe you don't worry so much about that. It's not ideal, but whatever. You bring it down to 50k, and now you're talking about middle class people who maybe don't have thousands of dollars to kick back to the IRS just because their income went up, you know, and the IRS continued to pay them based on their last year of income. You don't have that's not possible anymore. And there were two countries that actually tried this, Australia and the United Kingdom. Um, Comparativeness will note, these are Anglo countries. The Anglos, they all seem to do the same stuff and make the same mistakes over and over again. And in both countries, it was a catastrophe and they had to undo the programs because so many people were getting overpayments and it became so unpopular and people had quote unquote welfare debt that they couldn't pay back. And it, it it was a mess. And so the narrow point of that was just to say he doesn't know the policy specifics here. Like he he made a claim that was a mixed claim about popularity and about policy specifics, and he didn't actually understand the policy specifics. And there's also a claim here that's similar to the one Osita made, which was that something may look popular in a poll, but that doesn't mean once you do it, it's going to remain popular. And this mm-hmm. would be a perfect example. If you go to someone and you say, hey, what if we could target it only to people in need? Oh, okay. That sounds great. Sign me up for that. But you don't add in, actually, we can't do that. (laughs) Actually, you try to do that. And it's like, it's not Star Trek. Like it doesn't work (laughs) like that. Like uh, they're actual real people who have to figure this out and incomes are not clear and, you know, all of the whole thing. If you add that in, maybe it changes and maybe it doesn't. But maybe once you experience what happens when you try to do that, then maybe it does change. And that's what you saw in other countries as well. Matt, you say it's not Star Trek and I can't tell if you're trying to shade me or pander to me. I know you like Star Trek, (laughs) so I thought I would try to get that mention in. Um, Well, Well, I appreciate it. I mean, let me ask you this, Matt, because you are also a kind of numbers policy guy who's wonky in some of the ways that David Shore is, and you have a policy project which is explicitly progressive in its nature, right? So this idea that you're kind of be, going to be blindly following the numbers isn't kind of your agenda, right? You you have one. And I wonder if you encounter these scenarios that Shore is countering where his, his personal ideology may or may not square with what the numbers say and how you deal with that and how you emphasize kind of the prescriptive over the descriptive? I mean, I just don't uh, worry about popularity so much. Uh, You know, I think (laughs) I'm not in the game of winning elections. I mean, I think it's important, but that's just not what I do. So I try to put together policy ideas and packages that I think, you know, to the extent that I make compromises is related just to kind of thinking like, okay, well, where are the relevant members of Congress who like the stuff I write and might, you know what I mean? It's kind of like making a slight compromise just related to the politicians that you work with, um, which are on the far left, you know, of the, you know, electeds, um, not necessarily the far left of the public. Um, Even then, I don't always, I won't always do that. So it's a different thing. I'm trying to supply, you know, say policies for AOC, let's say, or Bernie mm-hmm. Sanders, which may or may never pass, but is important, you know, as part of just the give and take of political discourse and stuff to have those out there and make the arguments and see if you can move the ball a little bit, not necessarily trying to win elections. But I'm also just kind of skeptical that anyone has a clear you know, line on how to do that. I think, you know, you can tell lots of different stories and things Mm. change so much over time. And I don't know, it feels like if someone feels like someone would have solved the election question many decades ago, and they they don't seem to have. So obviously, all of this stuff as a policy matter is important. It's the stuff that I care about. This is not fundamentally a conversation about what policies are good and best. From the shortest perspective, it's about what is politically efficacious, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the other issues I have with the perspective is like, 
saying Democrats should means test their programs is a statement about actually existing political reality. Like Democrats do means test their programs. There's going to be more means testing in this reconciliation bill. So what's what's the surest problem? It seems like the Democratic Party is, is on the cusp of doing exactly what it thinks it ought to be doing to win elections. There's a section of uh, the interview that Shore did with Ezra Klein uh, a while back that the people were sharing that sort of kicked off this round of discussion where he says, uh, if you look inside the Democratic Party, there are three times more moderate or conservative non-white people than very liberal white people, but very liberal white people are infinitely more represented. That's morally bad, but it also means eventually they'll leave. I don't really understand how anybody who just sort of takes a, a cursory look at democratic policymaking over the last several decades, I, I, I don't understand how anybody could reasonably conclude, even now at this point where we've seen movement left, that it's liberals and progressives who are in the driver's seat of the party at a moment where it's looking like it's going to be an uphill climb to even do lowering the price of prescription drugs in reconciliation, where the climate provisions of the reconciliation bill are being gutted as we speak, when there's mm-hmm. the voting rights legislation is being held up, mm-hmm. when there's no help whatsoever of gun control bill passing this Congress. When the Biden administration, you can't blame this on Joe Manchin and Christian Cinema, mm-hmm. is dragging its feet on executive immigration policy. To say that student debt. Canceling student debt. So to, say, to say that like white liberals, even now, you know, are, are running the show here and determining how people perceive the Democratic Party, I think is kind of preposterous. Yeah. Um, we I, I are, think it's actually defensible in very specific terms. Uh, I, I agree with... Um, I agree with the, the bulk of what, what Osita was saying, but I do think it's uh, important to note that um, in Shore's view, those ideological self-identifications, whether you identify as liberal, moderate, or conservative, to the extent that they do track uh, real policy preferences, um, are really about social uh, issues kind of exclusively, so that within the Democratic Party, you have... Um, a lot of voters uh, who, or you have like a significant minority, uh, right, of voters who are reactionary on right. LGBT rights, abortion, et cetera, right. and the parties, um, you know, positioning and the way that they govern in blue states where they have total control does generally affirm white liberal opinion um, on those issues. So and are they defending what, what the police? Are they, are they, you know, cutting back? I, mean, I think, I think, to the extent that you see engagement on these cultural issues, I mean, again, the immigration stuff is not trivial. I don't, I don't think it's trivial that the Biden administration is being cautious about the extent to which it reverses Trump's policies. I don't think it's trivial that the Biden res- administration's response, and I think the response of a lot of Democratic politicians, has been not to cut funding from the police that kind of fizzled and evaporated, but to reinstate, to substantively reinforce the police, to declare rhetorical support for the police. Like, I, I think that there's a level at which we, we tend to believe that the course being taken by most Democratic politicians, because it's what people talk about on Twitter, is like the most left-wing form of engagement you can have in those issues. Where I think that, in reality, you see a lot of moderation, not just at the national level, on something like policing, on LGBT rights, on, on immigration. But, but I, I think even at the state and local level, well, you have I mean, in, in I, tough I think places... It is- I think it is significant, you know, in, in New York where we had, you know, a real uh, a program to provide um, income support to undocumented uh, immigrants uh, who were left out of the federal programs. Right. That is a righteous policy. Um, right. And it is, you know, whatever. So in, within that space, it is. But that's in New York. It is I mean, liberal. I, and I'm. Yeah. I don't think people in Ohio are running on that kind of thing. Or Right. You know. I mean, the, the issue is that Biden ran on funding the police more and won. Biden is doing shoreism as every moderate dim has always done. Yet the pattern, I would argue, in terms of how these things are reported on, present company excluded, is to blame any Democratic loss, no matter how conservative that candidate was, on the fact that they were too far left. And any leftist who wins, they're success is undermined as it being evidence of them being a fluke or being in a deeply blue district. And there's never any validation of the idea that moderate policies that don't actually map onto what even Shore would admit are very popular policies among the working class aren't electorally effective. I mean, the thing is, like, there, there are always going to be within democratic coalition politicians and policies that are out, you know, on the outer edge, right? There are going to be people and policies that are not in line 
with what most of the electorate wants. That's just a feature of coalition politics. It's not a novel feature. Under Clinton, you had the head of the Congressional Black Caucus marching with Louis Farrakhan at the Million Man March, right? Like, it's, it's just not a novel thing that we now have people in the Democratic Party who are more radical on race, on immigration, on these issues. That's always been the case. Mm. What is new is a set of structural features of our politics today, media environment, educational polarization, that have been in the works for a long time, that make it harder for Democrats, even moderate Democrats, to escape a perception of the natural national party. And so what Shore comes along and says, well, is that you can actually undo all of that as a matter of simply augmenting, changing, filtering your campaign rhetoric. Sound more like Obama in 2012. All of these people just sort of come flowing back to you and, and the problem's fixed. I don't think it's that simple. I think that everything that we've been experiencing over the last decades or so in politics is, is the product of a lot of deep-rooted structural trends. Obama, as good as he was at message discipline, and Iglesias and Shore have... Uh, praised him for this a lot, saw a bloodbath at the state level over the course of his term, lost a lot of governorship, lost both houses of Congress, not because he was a wokester and, and was burning the American flag and not talking about how America, like he did all of those things. And we still lost. I believe there are two Democratic senators in Arkansas at the first Obama Congress. The party that Shore is trying to create is the party that existed from 2004 or so through 2010, when you see that first midterm basically wipe out a lot of the blue blog Democrats. And so to say that, like, we, we haven't tried this stuff before and it's not, you know, like, th this is how the Democratic Party has operated for a long time. It's not for want of trying to reach out to moderates that they've struggled. Mm. But there are a lot of sort of issues intrinsic to, you know, the, the political landscape now that are just did hurt the party a lot. And, and I, don't, I don't think it's a matter of coming out and, and running on lowering prescription drug prices. It's going to undo all the biases that Shore rightfully talks about we're facing in the Senate. I don't, I don't think that it's because staffers uh, on the Warren campaign were saying Latinx in, in campaign documents. Well, I, I think I there's mean, a level of lunacy about all this. But look, can it, can it be both things? I, I do think that a lot of the, that some of the fringe ephemera of the left is off-putting. Do I think it is to some to some quadrant of some some quotient of voters? Do I think it would be the be all end all thing if politicians were offering something meaningful and more in addition to that? Would anybody care whether or not Warren put pronouns in her in her bio on Twitter if she were manifestly able to communicate in other kinds of ways and deliver on policies? No, I don't think I don't think that's true, which to me is a big problem is that there's never a conversation about using messaging to reorient people's political priorities such that even having distaste for some aspect of someone's approach isn't what's necessarily determinative and doesn't necessarily mean you have to abandon certain policies, right? Because every day voters are making decisions and creating hierarchies of what their priorities are. When a Trump voter that used to vote for Obama votes for Trump, it doesn't mean that you know, they couldn't have been racist or blah, 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 because they voted for Obama. No, but it does mean at a certain point they deprioritize whatever racism Trump was able to capitalize on or whatever other thing that Trump was able to capitalize on and prioritize whatever Obama was selling. And that is a completely missing part of this conversation entirely. I get a little bit mixed up and Eric might know this better than me because it does actually seems like sometimes Shore is just talking about the best way to do messaging and mm -hmm. not necessarily saying what we should do as policy. And then sometimes he dips his toe in policy and you're like, well, I'm so confused now. But on its face, to me, it's it's at least plausible, of course, that like what you say matters. Like it's got to matter a little bit. Some people see it. They resonate with it. And so if he wants to say, hey, what's upsetting people is if you use this slogan or you, you know, do sort of woke posturing or something like that. And if you would just cut that out, you, you could, you know, increase your vote share by half a percentage point or something like that. And they say, okay, I don't know if that's true. I suppose that's possible. And may, maybe in the future, it'll be other kinds of slogans that way. Maybe, maybe then you'll need to woke posture or something like, who knows? Like in the moment, if you've got a good window into what the best messages to send out are to, to convince a few extra people, then okay, I'm I'm like that's I guess I'm in principle I'm okay with it though I don't I doubt I guess the 
epistemology of maybe of how you come to know what the right slogans are. But then other times it's, no, we also just need to not do the thing that the slogan points to. And it's like, I don't know. I just get very mixed up there. Do voters pay attention to that? It seems like maybe not. Like, because one of the examples they use is is what the Republicans do. Republicans don't ever talk about we're going to cut corporate taxes, <laughs> you know? right. or we're going to cut taxes on the rich. I don't think they talk about it too much, from what I see. But then they go and do it. They definitely do do it, and then they they just don't talk about it too much. And you're like, okay, that that seems like a good example, you know, of don't talk about that, but still do it. But then yeah. in that case, why don't we just do, why are you then telling us not to do certain things? So, I mean, I think, I think the extent that Republicans do talk about things like tax cuts, they've, they've managed to frame it with the public in a way that makes it seem palatable. So the, we're really cutting taxes for job creators, right? Like we've developed all of these ideas about the way wealth works in the economy and what wealthy people are able to do in the economy that sound to a lot of working class people like, oh, well, that makes sense. Like this is going to work out for me, even if the guy at the top gets his tax rate shaved down a little. That's something that helps the overall economy. That took years of work, right? That took years of institution building, of building like think tanks and media outlets to get people to think that way about politics. After a period of time when, you know, the Democratic Party controlled Washington for a long time, they were passing, they passed the New Deal, they did great society. Like it took a lot of effort for the conservative movement to re sort of conceptualize these issues in the minds of the, the, the most of the American electorate. And that's ultimately what, the, what I think about the way messaging works. Like, I, I don't think there's a whole lot you can do over the course of the campaign to fundamentally realign the way people think about a political issue. You can sort of dodge certain attacks. You can make certain attacks of your own. They're kind of narrowly focused. But to, to sort of reshape how people think about politics and policy, that takes a lot of work. So I, I think just... Um... To clarify a couple aspects of, of Shorism, at least in my understanding, I agree with uh, Osita that you know the problems that the Democratic Party faces right now are structural. They're the product of decisions made decades ago in terms of how much to prioritize organized labor, how much to prioritize um, building up community organizations like Acorn um, that have put them in this sort of situation, and also you know excellent organizing by the right. At the same time, w within the space of a campaign, the Shorist sort of analysis isn't that you're going to persuade people with these messaging messages and uh, to sort of support something they didn't before, but rather it's kind of this uh, somewhat fatalist picture of the electorate where you have these voters basically um, who they are xenophobic, but they want health care. If they're thinking about the um, immigrants that moved in next door when they go into the ballot box, we're going to lose. If they're thinking about, um, you know, I guess, I don't know what, like higher Obamacare subsidies, we're going to win. Um, and so the, the goal is to just keep things salient. It's not about changing people's views, um, but, but, but changing the salience. And, you know, he cites, for example, that, that this leads to some counterintuitive situations where in the 2018 midterms, Republican candidates who are feeling the heat on uh, ACA repeal and aired um, advertisements that said, hey, I support pre-existing conditions. Uh, so I support regulatory protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, they did worse because even though they took a popular position on the issue, they raised the salience of it. They had voters thinking about health care, um, and then that caused them a, a marginal few to move uh, to the left. Um, whereas similarly, at least in his polling, he says, um, you know, during the family separation crisis, family separation was a deeply unpopular policy. Um, but when that was in the headlines, Democrats, like I think Claire McCaskill or, or whatever, their they're like uh, poll numbers in these redder states went down, suggesting that just because it made people think about immigration, it moved them to the right. And so it's this kind of, it, it's very, a very bleak outlook that says that, you know, politics in the campaign term can't really change opinion, but we need to kind of manipulate these um, you know, swing voters uh, by sort of keeping certain things uh, in their consciousness and certain things out of their consciousness uh, to the extent that we can. And maybe that'll make a difference of point something points on the margin. But that, that's, I think, I mean, idea. I think that's right. But like, so the fundamental issue is that there are two players in this game, right? So one of the things that yep. Shore said in his uh, interview with Ezra Klein is that Hillary Clinton lost because she raised the salience of immigration in 2016. 
I think there are a lot of things you can blame the Clinton clan point for in 2016. I don't think choosing to make immigration an issue in that campaign was one of them. The person who raised the salience of immigration in 2016 was Donald Donald Trump. Trump. David Roberts did an analysis of all of Clinton's campaign speeches uh, a couple of years ago, where he just lit- he literally just downloaded every speech that she made and did a content analysis. She talked about the economy and jobs way more than she talked about any other issue, certainly immigration, but also LGBT issues, race. She, it, she focused you know, to the extent that she, she made her speeches on the economy. Now, that might have been the economic policies that I liked. She might not have made, you know, delivered enough of those ads in, in key states. But when she was talking, she was talking about the economy and jobs. The fact that immigration was so salient to people wasn't, you know, the Democrats falling down on that job. It was the fact that Republicans, one, chose to make that an issue, and two, had a media infrastructure that allowed that issue to become more dominant than otherwise would have been, just on the basis of Democrats not really wanting to engage. So right. that's, that's yeah. the imbalance there. I do think that there's some bait taken, not just by Hillary, but by the left media, the liberal media, I should say, because Trump did raise the salience of it and people did rush to kind of match his argument, push back against his argument. The framing of, since he came down the stairs and said, you know, Mexican immigrants, or Mexico wasn't sending their best, it became Trump thinks Mexicans are rapist, which to everyone who agrees with Trump sounded like a lie because he said something more quote unquote nuanced than that, but to liberals felt like a real slam dunk. And so I do think that there was some of this appetite for responding to whatever provocation that the right puts out there. And they continue to do that. They say Mrs. Potato Head. They say CRT. You know, they say trans bathroom bill. And that's what the news cycle is about. What I think is the problem is that Democrats don't can't aren't able to figure out what the salience issue, the salient issue is for them that they should raise that actually motivates people to vote blue because it isn't necessarily Hillary Clinton's milquetoast economic policies. Right. And at the same time, Trump was also raising as a salient issue a lot of things that Hillary could be reasonably dinged on, including 90s era trade policy, et cetera, that the mainstream liberal media had very little appetite for. Yeah. I mean, so I think one of the key things, though, is that messages that are not salient for one group might be salient for the other. I mean, I think one of the reasons why Democrats jump on that stuff is because this kind of white suburban voter uh, who they've been winning more and more of, not just since 2016, but for the last 10 years of American politics, has genuinely been turned off by some of the Republican Party's rhetoric on race. I come from, I'm from Northern Virginia. Like, we've seen that firsthand, uh, that Senate race in 2006, where the Republican candidate uses a slur, uh, Democratic candidate wins Jim Webb. That, that's like the, the first moment where you see Northern Virginia start to turn really kind of decisively blue. And I think that there are a lot of communities that don't really care very much about social programs, that don't really want their taxes to be raised, that are actually pretty fiscally moderate, who've just decided to vote more and more Democratic just because they find the Republican Party kind of culturally distasteful. So maybe you win those kinds of voters with latching onto those issues, but then those working class voters, other parts of the country, where you see Democrats really struggling, maybe that's where you see some of the risk there. So the, the key, the secret weapon, whatever it is, is how do you get both of those portions of the electorate aligned on the same kinds of issues and using them, that whatever those issues might be, to create a democratic majority in the future. Um, that's that's the, the challenge. How do you get them both without sacrificing one or the other? Well, one point you raised, Osita, is that the Republicans have had a multi-decade long project of figuring out how to align their messaging with their political goals and convince Americans that trickle-down economics is real and the invisible hand in the market. And if we cut taxes for CEOs, it's going to be good for you. And there have been millions and billions of dollars probably spent on those efforts in, in the context of think tanks, et cetera, and the whole creation of Fox News and the right-wing news infrastructure. There doesn't seem to be the same appetite for that on the left. By contrast, you have organizations that are ostensibly the left organizations, policy groups like Center for American Progress, joining the chorus of saying, oh, we shouldn't talk about defund. This isn't a good idea. And very much embracing shorism. And there doesn't seem to be anybody left who's engaged in the project of doing the long-term persuasion effort. It feels like no one believes in in persuasion. You had this whole kind of Todd Nisi Coates style Afro-pessimism that said, white people are intrinsically racist. They'll never change their mind about anything. It doesn't matter if they once voted for Obama. They're now inexorably Trumpian. This is a core part of their personality, basket of deplorables, yada, yada, yada. And so everyone has abandoned that project altogether in the long term or 
the short term. And that's what feels like for me is driving this increasing focus on both demographics and polling, because it's all about having having to hack the current electorate as opposed to doing what I think traditionally has been the work of politics, which is convincing people that your policy prescription can benefit their lives. And I don't think that's an accident. I think it's in part because the people who are running CAP and all these other institutions aren't especially invested in doing some of the policies that I think some of the progressives here would argue would inure to the benefit of working people would be felt in their pocketbooks and could win a generation of Democrats in the same way that the New Deal did. Yeah, I, I think that um, this is sort of tangential, but but I think related to the point that you're making, which is that um, my, I think, main critique of Shorism might be that um, that it's a prescription for a democratic party that doesn't exist insofar as I think the steel man version of shorism is kind of the one that, that Matt was sort of alluding to before, which is this idea of we're going to have a real clear eyed sense of like the political implications, the likely political implications of our actions. And we're going to calibrate it such that when we take a political risk, we know what the risk is and we're, we're doing it for a big substantive payoff or for a big structural advantage down the line. Right. Maybe D.C. statehood is unpopular, but it nets us probably two senators automatically every cycle. You do that. Maybe, maybe, I I don't think this is true, but maybe some sort of labor reforms uh, aren't polling that well, but we know that the downstream effects are to make our party stronger. And if you had, uh, you know, this sort of ideologically motivated vanguard party that was at least somewhat uh, analogous to the conservative movement, you know, in the GOP, you know, since Goldwater, I I could see implementing this and, and it being very effective. Um, the, the, I think the hazard, or, or I think part of why Shore attracts such ire um, from some quarters, is that if you tell the existing Democratic Party that, hey, talking about immigration is going to reduce your chances of re-election, but once in office, quietly as possible, do take actions on immigration, and yeah, that's going to increase your risk of losing the election, um, but it's going to deliver the substantive benefit you know, if you are Joe Biden or if you are someone, whatever, a Democratic poll who has maybe some liberalish, uh, you know, views as a reason you're not a Republican, but you're not, your job security is more important to you than the progressive ideological project. You know, to tell them don't talk about X is to kind of tell them don't do X um, within a certain band. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think it would be good to have a Democratic Party that said, uh, you know, um, if there's evidence that uh, framing a race neutral redistributive policy as like a form of reparations. Um, uh, we're not going to do that because the substantive benefit is basically nil and, and it has a political cost. But, you know, if we have a chance to free 11 million people from uh, living in uh, the constant sort of threat of, uh, you know, deportation or illegality, we're going to do that. But I just don't think that that party is available. Just to add on to a point um, Eric was le- making, I mean, look, you elect the people who are good at appealing to this section of the elect, uh, electorate that people want, this kind of moderate white voter, and they're going to support like moderate conservative policy. They're going to start saying that we shouldn't actually, you know, lower prescription drug price. I mean, the, like, the hope seems to be that you can elect Joe Manchin without Joe Manchin being Joe Manchin, right? You can get that seat without the person occupying that seat actually being substantively moderate and conservative to an extent that would actually frustrate the democratic agenda. And it's just not true. That's what we saw in the last Democratic Congress. Like if you, the people who are going to be good at winning these seats in the heartland and more conservative places are actually going to be more conservative Democrats. You but can't get this kind true, of sleeper Ocea? agent. Because this is the argument that Paul Begala was making in a semi little viral clip uh, there are exceptions. this past week yeah. with Nina Turner. And Nina Turner is making the case that all of these policies are very popular in Joe Manchin's district. And Paul Begala is saying the thing that presumes they're not. And what went unsaid in that exchange is that, correct me if I'm wrong, Bernie Sanders won more votes in West Virginia than Joe Manchin did uh, back in 2016. And so there absolutely is an appetite for some version of Bernie Sanders-y populism. And right. we you know, we forget that West Virginia until recent history was in fact a blue state. It was. And we all have this collective delusion that the last 15 to 20 years is the status is, is a kind of right. permanent status quo. What I would say is that the key thing there is that you have to actually ma- activate that electorate over time with organizing. I don't think it's the case that if you just put out a left-wing set of policies, you can sort of naturally assume that all those people are going to come to flock to a left-wing candidate over the course of one election cycle. You need is to that not what build... happened with Bernie in 2016 in West Virginia? 
Is that not a demonstration that policies to a certain extent can cause a large number of voters, a larger number of voters than to a to certain extent? But if it, were, if it were true broadly and universally, Bernie Sanders would be the president right now. Like, I think well, that there's, 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 there's a level of organizational work that takes a lot of time. In well, well let's, like let's disaggregate that, Osita, because sometimes the left has these conversations. And what, once we get to this precipice, everyone falls back on, well, Bernie lost. So that lesson falls flat. When we all know in every other context, when we're arguing with conservatives, we have myriad reasons why Bernie lost, including um, billions of dollars in unpaid media, trashing these policies to, despite them still winning in the polls, the fact that all of the moderates got a call from Obama and dropped out in the 11th inning, like all things that are, you know, should have been anticipated by the campaign and aren't excuses, right. but also don't undermine the core truth of the popularity of the policies over the policies that are being offered by the other people in right. that race or in various local races across the country. Right. Well, I mean, I think that Joe Biden won a large amount of support in 2020 during the primaries from working class people of all races. That was a kind of the big disappointment of that campaign that Sanders, you know, a lot of the support that he saw in 2016 in some of those communities was eaten away by Biden. And what um, was the and, number one, what was the number one priority of voters in 2020? I'm sure you know this. I'm sure everybody on this panel knows this very well. Right. To, beat, to beating Donald Trump. To but, beating that just Donald speaks Trump. To, but that speaks to the extent to which the economic policies in and of themselves can take its back seat to other political concerns that voters have. Correct. That's the challenge. Well, so how do we get people right. to actually prioritize those issues consistently, to understand what they really mean and how important they are, and to activate that electorate consistently over the course of multiple elections? Right. That's not just something you can do with a particular rhetorical approach over the course of one campaign. You need organizing, labor organizing, building community organizations, reaching out to people where they sit outside of campaign season to get them to view, to adopt a particular view of the way the economy works and how politics should work. That's what actually builds you a durable left majority that can sustain itself no matter who the candidate on the top of the ticket is across multiple elections. That's the kind of work that needs to be done. And that's the kind of work that needs to be done in places like West Virginia, right? I, I think that that's, that's the issue. Um, and that, that t that's a harder project than just saying they're going to primary somebody over the next election you know, say all the right things, and then that's not actually going to give you the majority you need to, to prevail over the mainstream Democratic candidate. It's a lot harder than that. And if it weren't that hard, we would have already won. Well, let's stipulate that everyone believes that we need to have more organizing and that organizing is important. But you're a journalist. Um, Eric's a journalist. Matt is a policy wonk who is advising politicians who are largely concerned with this electoral game. So, with the proviso that none of us here are going to be the ones that are going to go to West Virginia and start trying to dig roots in the community, I do think it's worth having a conversation about what can be done in these electoral contexts, right? That's what David Shore, that's what all of this is about. And so to me, the res my response to Bernie Sanders wasn't able to pull it out in 20 2020 is to say, okay, what if the Bernie campaign had also done a better job of arguing that it was the candidate to beat Trump, which I would argue yeah. Bernie did not land those punches. He right. was very open about the fact that he th thought that Joe Biden could beat Trump. He, he really wouldn't criticize the guy, wouldn't lay a finger on him. OK, so to me, I, I agree with you that you have to get people to reprioritize things. But I also don't think that a, an election in the context of Trumpism and a threat that many people perceived as unique is a reason to discount, I think, I think some positive lessons that were learned from some of the progressive successes of the last few years. And my, part of my biggest frustration with Shoreism is that it seems to be reinventing the wheel for folks, people who are more moderate, people like um, Matt Iglesias and even some conservatives I've seen really glom onto this messaging who don't like the idea of defund the police and these kind of left policy prescriptions to say the problem is a set of policies that nobody has ever fought for, ignoring the extent to which Bernie Sanders did do popularism. He called it populism, and it was largely effective. And that I think that project hasn't been taken especially seriously because the corporate Democratic Party isn't really invested in pursuing any of those policies on a substantive basis. I think that, you know, it is noteworthy that for sure, Bernie 2016 is um, kind of, Obama 2012, I guess, is his, his you know, uh, optimum model from an electoral perspective, but he thought 2016 Bernie was also very uh, 
uh, viable in that, it, that his belief is that Bernie would have won. He thinks that in 2020, Bernie uh, took too many different policy positions, including some that were unpopular. So, you know, which, in, which ones does he, um, find whatever, just, 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 I mean, uh, uh, in general, just Bernie just took more positions, right? He was like very sort of focused on $15 Medicare for all. Um, you know, in, in, in the first, uh, kind of campaign, we had, you know, uh, stuff that's very righteous, right? Giving voting rights to Fallon, uh, or people who are currently in jail. Um, just a right. He sort of like took up everyone's, everyone's flag, uh, you know, every left wing, uh, activist group and in Shore's view, this, you know, possibly cost him votes. But I think the other element here that, that Osita gestured at and that, that we're, we're all gesturing at is, you know, which is also important to Shoreism, uh, is that the, the media is incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, in his view, in terms of uh, the outcomes of elections, earned media is, is so valuable. And what we recently saw, and this is actually an argument against both popularism and it's a challenge for the Bernie model as well, is that... Um, withdrawing U.S. troops from Afghanistan was a very popular policy. And then Joe Biden tried to do it. And yeah. the media unified in opposition to him. And there were other things going on. Delta was surging. But bottom line is his approval went down massively. Um, and the media right, did but uh, doesn't, enact doesn't the, with, doesn't the withdrawal still pull positively, though, despite Biden's poll numbers being low? It, it does. But the, the issue is the question for politicians is not about preserving the popularity of the policy, but preserving their personal popularity. So right. But my, my argument is I don't know that it's fair to say that it was the withdrawal from Afghanistan that caused Joe Biden's low popularity rating. Right. So that's what ends up. I'm not it saying was that the you're media. saying that. Right. No, no. But I'm just saying that the media is an obstacle because if it unites an opposition to trying to create a panic about Bernie Sanders as a socialist in the general election, it's plausible that it could work. Um, and, and that's a challenge in the uh, building structural power in the society and among the elite so that the media is less uh, of a threat to social democratic politics, I think is part of the project because we can't totally bracket it because it's, it's right. always going to be there and it's always going to be a factor. The media, the media is not going to change. So you need political institutions that are capable of galvanizing the electorate, even if the media is attacking left candidates, right? And that's a difficult thing to do. What do you think happened with Donald Trump? Because no one would would claim that the media was any friend of his in 2016. And in fact, much of the Republican Party was very much opposed to him throughout the primary. We did not get the dropping out and coalescing on, around an alternative uh, that the Democrats did this time around that would have potentially knocked Trump out of the primary. Um, and I had low favorability ratings, uh, tons of negative coverage, and yet he won. And then you have these kind of FDR models that say, I welcome their hatred and people who are willing or are able to spin a certain kind of antagonism from folks that the people hate into a victory. You know, it seems to me that Bi I mean, Biden's problem is not that he withdrew from Afghanistan. That is, I think, in many ranks. But for him doing that, his popularity might actually be higher. And so I'm not arguing, I mean, sorry, it might be lower even. So I'm not arguing that there was a horrible media cycle against him over Afghanistan. I think it's interesting that despite that media cycle, the withdrawal is still popular, that despite all of the billions of dollars in, in anti-Medicare for all ads that are spent, that Medicare for all is still yeah. popular. And yeah. what the frustrating thing about surism is for me is that there seems to be this conflation, this kind of sloppy conflation of things sometimes that just very conveniently blames every good thing for every bad poll number for a politician without looking at the fact that he's been not doing any of these executive orders, has basically accomplished nothing beyond COVID relief, which I'll grant him in the context of his administration, that he's barely anywhere to be seen, that much of the country thinks that he's senile, and on and on and on down the list. I See, I think that, I mean, what the Afghanistan example shows is that you know, and what I think may be frustrating is that there are so many variables, so right. many variables that yeah. You kind of go, OK, I mean, I suppose this is one of them, but it could also be overwhelmed by something else and actually only works if it is coupled with two or three other things, mm -hmm. including the media representing it correctly. And that you just, you know, I, I go m to my uh, attitude towards the whole thing, which is just to kind of shrug and say, well, you just 
roll the dice and maybe you win an election. Um, just do, I mean, do the right thing. <laughs> yeah, because it's just yeah. so, so difficult. Like that was a really good policy that he did on the merits, popular and he sunk. And then the same thing with the election. I mean, Joe Biden beat Sanders, obviously, in the primary. And I wonder, hypothetically, if you switched out their platforms, but you kept them as they are, Biden mm -hmm. as the former VP and, you know, does Biden still win? I mean, in my mind, he probably does still win. Oh, I think it's a blowout. Oh, uh, absolutely. And absolutely. so it's like, so, uh, what am I supposed to conclude about this? <laughs> well, that, for is, that, is, that is multiple variables, right? Biden's a statesman that people trust, that has high name recognition, and people think are going to beat Trump. Bernie has a bunch of policies that are very popular that got him to second place, but couldn't overcome the fact that the number one priority was beating Trump. So this is this gets back to my point about political prioritization and that there's never any effort to, I think, in these conversations. To your point, Matt, talk about how these policies work together yeah. and what set of policies could be combined to achieve the maximum results and also how to get people to reprioritize them. Like, I, I will admit I, I'm not one of these these leftists who is not willing to ha engage in a conversation about the fact that a certain kind of conversation about police defunding is polarizing and off-putting, not just as like white racists as it is in the public imagination, but some degree of blacks and Latinos as well. Like this is one of Shore's points that it moved a significant portion of Latinos to the right to defund lingo. My response to that is one, we need to work on our our um uh, persuasion more because there is almost never a conversation about what defund actually looks like or the really crucial fact, which is that increasing funding doesn't actually bring down crime or, or bring or make people safer. And that, to reframe the conversation around public safety and make the left the face of public yeah. safety instead of this kind of, you know, abstraction of what defund is. Let's just explain defund. But the other thing I would say is that even if you just want to lean into defund and not touch that at all, I would argue that you could advocate for enough other things that are higher on the priority list for people that they might not even care. And I think with immigration, this is key. Because a lot of the antipathy around immigration has to do with people's feeling that it's a zero sum game. And if immigrants come, I'm already precarious and it's going to get worse for me. And if there were a better social safety net, if people felt more stable, if the economy were doing better, if there was a universal jobs program or whatever it is, then the salience of immigration and the quote unquote threat from the southern border or whatever it is just wouldn't be as poignant. Well, you know, immigration is a funny issue because immigration actually is popular polling wise and not in the kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know, push poly kind of sense. Um, Americans are pro immigrants, uh, you know, kind of remarkably so as mm. compared to Europe and other countries and the polls, even Republicans are like pretty pro immigrant. Obviously, there are certain issues that you can get people peaked about. But I mean, this goes to, I guess, in some ways, the I feel like bad uh, label of popularism, right? Do popular things, do popular things. Because if you were to point out, hey, actually, you know, increasing immigration, you know, polls well or something like that, um, you know, the point would be, the point that I think Shore would make would be to say, but among the critical voters, yeah. mm -hmm. the key yeah. voters. And so it's like, okay, so what you what you're saying is, you know, it's more like, appeal to the median voter, whoever's kind of on the fence or the swing voters or something like that. It's not really about popularity. The persuadable, right. the persuadable it's, voter. It's, yeah. And then it's like, that's just a, I feel like you've not done a good job of branding your movement here to be, right. you know, that's a very unrepresentative population and maybe they hold a power position in the same way that Manchin does right in mm -hmm. the Senate where it's like, Oh, you're just one dude and you're really idiosyncratic, but yeah, you're right on that cusp. But you know, then you run into issues where if you focus on them, you know, do you now create a new swing voter? You know, does, right. is there someone else in the mix? Because it's not like people are just left to right and there's someone in the in the middle. Maybe some other group of people get a little alienated or maybe become wishy-washy on on which side of the fence they're I on. I hope and, so, listeners. So. You know what I've been pitching you? Be the swing voter you want to be. <laughs> um, but I, that's a really important point, Matt. And I want to I want to drill down that just a little bit while before we wrap up, because before the Shorism cycle was a cycle that I liked quite a bit, which was the Heather McGee cycle, where Demos had put out this study that 
argued that the persuadable voter isn't persuaded by ignoring race and doing it class only or vice versa, but that there was a very compelling message that was shown to work very well with exactly this group, which is to combine those two things. She said, you have to actually give people a new way to think about the dominant narrative. Um, Because it's not like they can ignore the dominant narrative. They need to recast the dominant narrative as a tool of the plutocrats, as a tool that stops us from joining together across lines of race to do what we can only do together and what we can't do alone. Things like adequately fund our infrastructure and our schools, things like things like tackle climate change, rewrite our trade laws to make sure that every American wants uh, who wants one has a decent job. Um, And it's really important not to ignore how profoundly uh, racialized the story of American economy and government has been for all of our history. So her basic thing is. You, you, the basic message is the 1% wants to divide us up along racial lines so they continue to steal the fruits of our labor for them and have all of this uh, economic equality. They want to exploit us by playing off of each other, but we're smarter than that. We're a country of immigrants. We're a country, uh, a, a, plural, a pluralistic country, and that's something we've always been proud of. And we're going to actively call out the division, the polarization that's being um, seated by the right, but not to blame white people as being racist deplorables, but to say we can overcome this together and let's actually refocus on the class solidarity that we have amongst each other. And that poll show <laughs> is effective. And it's very curious to me why there hasn't seemed to be the same appetite for pursuing the Heather McGee approach as there has been for the David Shore approach. The David Shore approach is just in keeping with what Democrats already wanted to do. I mean, this just right. goes back to the very beginning of our conversation. Like, what he's advocating for, you could call David Shoreism in a way Emmanuelism, right, or Pelosiism. Like, mm-hmm. this is just what Democrats do. I think it's true that Dem- Shore is a more left wing person, is sort of more, more open to certain left wing policy ideas. But this fundamental tamp down on cultural issues, talk about other kind of kitchen table stuff without connecting things like race and class, just sort of avoid making race as salient um, as often as you can. You know, that, that, that's the kind of thing Democratic pollsters, strategists have always wanted to hear. Right. And again, it used to work. Like it used to, it used to pay off in a way that it doesn't anymore um, mm-hmm. for a lot of different reasons. I mean, you asked before a couple of minutes ago, you know, why was it that Trump managed to succeed in spite of the fact that the media was against him? Well, a large part of the media wasn't against him. I mean, the conservatives have an alternative media ecosystem. Those popular television shows, news television, is conservative media. So they had that alternative infrastructure. They also had the fact that even the liberal publications or liberal uh, television outlets that opposed Trump gave him all of this kind of free airtime that they were not giving to somebody like Bernie Sanders, you know, to have his message sent out unfiltered. And you can have somebody come in at the end and say, well, that was really bad. But like, you've just broadcast a campaign speech to millions and millions of people unedited, you know. So there are all these ways in which Trump was able to you know, leverage and overcome that. It's a matter of overcoming, as Eric was saying before, a lot of the structural issues in play in our politics. It's, it's, it's partially about having the right message. But if you don't have an actual organizing infrastructure and you don't have alternative media institutions that actually sustain that message across the electorate, that are able to counter message across the, against the messages that are being delivered by the mainstream press and against the messaging that's being delivered by your opposing candidates, then having the right message in and of itself isn't going to do the thing for you, right? I think it's, it's just it's something that I think both Shore and, and the certain people on the left, in a weird enough way, are, are both kind of wrong about in the same ways. I think it's, it's about more than just saying the right things. We, we always say the right things. Like we, we have, you know, our, our candidates... Yeah. Well, our candidates are, you know, <laughs> Bernie Sanders was saying the right things, right? There are lots of progressive candidates for across the, the country the who say the right part. things. Yeah. But I would argue, but I mean, I, I don't, this could be a whole other conversation about this, the stylization of left media. I mean, and, and I think some of us on the left have been having this conversation more robustly recently. You know, why isn't there a left media infrastructure, an alternative left media infrastructure, the way that there was an alternative right media infrastructure that did embrace Trump, like the OAN style, yeah, Rush yeah. Limbaugh yeah. style alternative media. Well, part of it is that I think that to the extent that there is an alternative left media, like the program that you're on, like the program that you have, Matt, right. there isn't the same relationship between left politicians and us. They don't really seem to have much of an appetite to come on these shows. There are tougher questions that are asked in these shows, and there's tough questions that they get on the 
on the mainstream media, but it seems like they have more of an appetite to, you know, be asked, you know, how much does this cost by Brianna Keeler? You know, how are you going to pay for it? Then they do being asked, okay, why won't you force a vote by Brianna Gray? And that's a perfectly legitimate choice, but the right is different. And yeah. the the fact that Donald Trump will go on some of these friend shows boosts the profile of those shows and creates a sense of legitimacy that doesn't exist on the left because we have to beg and scrape for, for crumbs, yeah. frankly. And I also think that there is a disrespect on the left more broadly for any kind of communication strategy that's broader. So there isn't a coordinated messaging campaign. There are not talking points that go out. Um, there doesn't seem to be an appetite for people in these offices to make clear what their agenda is to left media so that we can be understanding what the plan is instead of kind of having the skepticism that's brewed yeah. out of the lack of transparency. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. But I mean, I also think that there's there's a, a fundamental kind of medium challenge in that the thing that ordinary people look to for political information, uh, working class people, is usually... TV, right? It's usually like talk radio. Like it's these mediums where the left is not very strong. We have a lot of podcasts. I don't want to say that working people, there aren't working people listening to Bad Faith and all these other podcasts. But like, hey, Joe for Rogan's the most part, killing the game. Joe, he is. But you I know. think I think that it's 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 out, overshadowed, outmatched by the reach that these kind of dominant other dominant platforms have. And so, the, you know, there's a question of whether it's even possible to c- compete with that. But I, I think that the if, if there is a way for us to do so, it won't necessarily be by trying to go toe-to-toe with them on just the question of having media outlets. It's, can you build real kind of tangible connections with people at the local level, at the state level, in those communities that we're trying to reach, where they see the left as a route to political power, where they're being shown the left as politically efficacious in concrete terms, day in, day out, year in, year out, whether you know you have people in your community, organizing your workplace, organizing your apartment building. Like th- those are the kinds of things, If we even if we can't compete in media, those are the kinds of things that over time can build political constituencies, even in places where it is difficult for us to run campaigns right now. That's kind of what I'm talking about. I think it's, it's important to have alternative media institutions and infrastructure. I think that's great. But ultimately, I think that the, the real challenge is demonstrating kind of political efficacy that wins people over to the left and, and builds networks, builds connections with communities that can actually pay off electorally um, beyond just sort of having people say the right things over the right kinds of channels. But see, I was in a meeting once uh, recently of a bunch of left folks who are trying to figure this out. And I won't say who was there. That's a off the record meeting. Did they do it? Did they figure it out? <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, because here's what happens. There is an organizer, a, a labor person present, yeah. who is frustrated, reasonably so, that there is not more coverage of the John Deere strike and all the other labor right. strikes that are kind of happening in a really unprecedented, interesting way right now. You have people like Jordan Charrington and some others on the left who, like, God bless them, are on the ground covering these things 100% of the time. And who, frankly, get fewer clicks on those videos as a consequence. Yeah. But do it anyway. Yeah. heroic. And then when I want to re- when I try to bring up ways that you can cover those things differently to get more media traction, namely in my view, making sure that the enemy is clear and that the enemy is somebody who folks know already, right? Mm-hmm. So to what extent are there elected Democrats in addition to Republicans who in our yeah. own party is obstructing the PRO Act, uh, is this really all coming down to filibuster reform? And should we be saying Joe Biden is misrepresenting the extent to which he will stand with labor if he won't come out vocally and support these strikes and Mm -hmm. also get rid of filibuster so that we can actually get this labor reform that even Joe Manchin supports, right? I think that kind of framing in an article on Bernie or AOC on MSNBC would start to grab attention in the way that X thousand um, John Deere workers are striking today just doesn't. And I'm not, that's not a value judgment. I wish we all cared, but we can sit here and wring our hands and lament that people aren't focused on these things and they don't care enough about what we want them to care about. Or we can 
respond in a way that might be able to move the needle. And what I find is that when I raise those kinds of points, oftentimes there's a certain degree of eye rolling and frustration because there isn't any fundamental respect for the communication aspect of mm-hmm. actually bringing eyes to the kind of organizing efforts that I agree are absolutely needed and are ongoing. There are people right. already doing direct aid. There are people who are making those relationships with the community, but they don't get amplified meaningfully for various institutional and I think framing reasons that are worth discussing. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. And I think that I think that certainly MSNBC, you know, all, all these all these television networks that could be doing better. It's just a question of, you know, can we can we reasonably expect them to? And well, if we can't you. Mm-hmm. You know, then what's and our what role? Next? I think that having you know podcasts like this, different, you know, there are a lot of media outlets well, we have been started up the last couple of years. <laughs> do what you can. But like the thing is, like the the strike is the the most important thing to me. I mean, it's important to get eyeballs onto it, but like that in and of itself is a form of political action that builds power. You know, and I think that if 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 even if even if it's not being covered, I think that there are things that are happening in communities where you see those kinds of actions take place. That are building the left, that, that build power, that make it easier for candidates to come down the line and, and win in those places. Yeah. That seems to me the key thing. I, I think it's true, though, that people could be doing a better job, elected officials who call themselves progressives be, could be doing a better job of, of amplifying those things. Well, did you but, see this? Did you see what's happening? So there's, a, there's this public event happening with Bernie and AOC and all of them. Is it today or is it tomorrow? Um, here it is. It's it's tomorrow. Uh, no, it's today. What's in the damn bill? A panel discussion with progressive leaders on the reconciliation bill starring yeah. Senator Sanders, Representative AOC, William Barber, Varshini, Perka- you know, from um, Sunrise Movement and on and mm-hmm. on and on. Who is this for? I would argue. I'm not mad mm-hmm. at it. I'm just wondering who is going to tune into this YouTube discussion Mm-hmm. with these people and how is that putting pressure on anybody well, versus think tank e- events e- each of these people can go on tv bernie and aoc are on tv pramila they're all on tv all week talking infrastructure i have a hard time believing that any of these hosts are going to kick progressives off their programming so the question is what can they say when they're on i'm not i'm not opposed to you at all about that other things mm. need to be done but there are tools at our disposal currently that i feel aren't being sufficiently exploited there is a way to make a stir when you go on tv There's a way. There are closed doors that have been closed door conversations that have been happening for months now where it's clear that it's not just Manchin and Cinema. that Politico reported months ago that there were at least a dozen other Democrats who are going to be a rotating villain if that if they needed to be. And that there are a lot of people who are being protected, frankly, tacitly by progressives who won't call them out. Yeah. Or who won't be more explicit about what what is being bargained for behind the scenes, right? Yeah. And some of the conversation about you know corporate influence that's happening now is good. It's progress. I'm glad that we're talking about Joe Manchin's daughter and stuff like that. But if you want to create a media media cycle, I don't know. I might go on TV and say Joe Manchin's daughter should be prosecuted. Yeah. She 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 you know her actions demand prosecution, <laughs> and that's yeah. something that we should be talking about. In, in the bundle of things that could to, could persuade yeah. Joe Manchin. But I mean, you know here's I mean? the thing, and this is what, and I mean, it goes back to the sh- the shrugging uh, philosophy, which is like, well, 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 okay, so what? Then what? Like, what happens? I don't know. Who cares what you say on TV? <laughs> I mean, what's going to happen? You know, like, is Joe Manchin actually going to change his vote? Is it? I don't know, How? but we can prosecute well, his daughter. That well, seems you like a win-win fun to me. Doing that for sure. <laughs> I mean, I think you probably. I mean, from what I've read, I don't know enough, but she seems like maybe <laughs> she maybe she has, broke the law. Uh, she go to jail, law, right? So for sure. <laughs> but you know, if if the idea is like this is going to help us get the reconcil, you know, the three and a half trillion bill, it's like probably not. But I don't know. Maybe it'll help with elections. Some um, I don't. I have no idea. I, I, I really do don't think, know. I do think it goes to that narrative change that Heather McGee is talking about. That you, Asita, were talking about when we're saying we were describing what the right was able to do over decades, which is that to me the alternative script is that we have a two-party duopoly, that the real reason that none of these things are moving through is because there are almost as many Democrats invested in not changing the economic status quo of this country as there are Republicans, that money in politics is a huge problem and that it's not going to, there's not going to be no bargaining 
here at all, that we have to have a much more active populace, that there's climate denial on both sides of the aisle and so far as that Biden's still issuing these permits and slashing the meager environmental reforms that were even in this bill and on and on and on and on. And while that might not have the short-term benefit, there are going to be long-term results. And frankly, not that long-term if we remember how the Tea Party movement in and of itself was able yeah. to reshape a lot of the right politics in this country over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, I mean, so I don't, I don't know how much time we have left, but to bring it back to shoreism, you know, I mean, think, I think that the Again, you know, I no disrespect to to David Shore. I I like him. I think he's a smart guy, a good guy. But I think that all of this conversation we're having now about what should we do with polls, in a way, kind of just serves to sublimate all the things you're talking about. Politics is much larger than that. The choices that shape it are much larger than that. Even if you have the right message, how are you getting it out? You know, and and what do you say when you have the opportunity to to go on those platforms? What are the incentives that drive what, what's being shown on those platforms? You know, those are the, the, I think to an extent that people don't fully appreciate, those are the things that actually drive politics. And it's very hard, I think, for candidates who, you know, carefully adopt a particular rhetorical approach to rely on that strategizing alone um, for their political success. I think that there are other factors that, that shape what people do and and. and uh, think about politics at the ballot box. There's one thing, you know, if, if we could leave off with one thing that I think has been, um, I don't know, just didn't get as much attention as some of the short stuff did. So the New York Times did a pretty good piece, actually. Um, I think before the, the Shore interview ran with um, Klein on this new report, the Democratic strategist from Iowa put out on factory towns, these places in the Midwest, um, the Rust Belt, where you saw between 2012 and 2020, significant erosion in support for the Democratic candidate. So one of the things he says is, uh, in, in places where support for the Republican candidate grew between 2020, uh, 12 and 2020, more than 70% of those areas su- suffered declines in manufacturing jobs, and nearly half of the Republican Party's gains in those states, the 10 states that are covered in the report, came in communities where there had been both manufacturing cuts and as a result of jobs being lost, worsening health care. They found in some states, the loss of union members just in 2010 alone exceeded Biden's margin of victory. Mm. Um, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands, millions of jobs being lost, threatened, that being a driver of, of what actually happened electorally. You know, again, as I said before, I think it's more complicated than just saying, okay, well, you just go out there with a message about how bad the rich are and, and you know, these economic programs, and then those voters will come back to you. I think it's, it's more complicated than that. At the same time, you know, I, I think that the left can win in those places. I think the left is the only place that can win, the, the only faction that can win those places back. It's just going to take time. And, and for sure, anybody else to say, what will actually matter in those areas where people have lost their jobs and are working hard to, to get by and, and they don't know what their town's going to survive, like the thing that they really want to hear is, uh, about lowering prescription drug prices and, and you know, the Democrats don't like to fund the police. Like, it, it's more complicated than that. Like, people engage with politics to the extent that they engage at all in a very basic level. What is happening in my life, not what people are talking about on Twitter, what people are fighting about <laughs> um, culturally. Like, you know, they're, they're, it might redound to certain cultural anxieties that they have, but, like, the, the thing that's going to win back those places is not going to be words, right? It's going to be organizing. It's going to be action. And it's going to take time. What? That's my perspective. Maybe I, you disagree, I you. Brianna. I, I but hear I, you. I, think I hear you. But what you just said about those towns is also words that Trump exploited to get votes there. Right. He talked about jobs being moved overseas. He didn't yeah. frame it in the way that we would like on the left. Yeah. But if anyone were soliciting my comms advice, here's a freebie. Everyone's talking about supply chain issues in Christmas. And I think this is an opportunity to have a more robust conversation about why we don't make any of those things in America anymore, why we don't have storage facilities in America, why it is that shareholder primacy has meant that there has been a trade-off where we don't store anything locally because we'd rather pay dividends out to the 1% who have gotten exorbitantly richer over the past 30 years, but particularly even in the course of this global pandemic. And then that's the kind of entry point that the left should be using with its limited media appearances in the mainstream news to change the broader narrative. But I've kept you both here longer than I said I would. 
It looks like we lost Matt. Hopefully we'll get him back just to say mm-hmm. goodbyes. But Asita, where can people find your work? I know you have an article about this coming out soon. At the New Republic, uh, where I do most of my writing. I also have a newsletter. I guess you might be able to link it to it in the, the show notes that I've started Absolutely. up recently. Yeah. And what, what will people find in your newsletter? Oh, I mean, it's it's more political writing, writing about culture sometimes too. Um, but just just more me, I guess. Okay. And I will also put the link to Matt Brunig's podcast, which is excellent with his wife, Liz Brunig. Also, obviously, uh, his work at the People's Policy Project. You guys are probably familiar, but we'll link that as well. And you can find Eric Levitz's work at the New York Magazine. Excellent as always. And thank, thank you, Osita and everybody else for joining today. Thank you for having me. A reminder to everybody that this podcast comes out twice a week. A premium episode comes out on Monday that you can get every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube, don't forget this is a podcast. To get full episodes, including ones that are behind a paywall, go to patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. To get more episodes, please do subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell, and like this video. 